Hello and welcome to the Penguin Prof channel. In today's episode, we are going to tackle tautomeric shifts. That's the explanation for why sometimes nucleobases misbehave. You can get adenine pairing with cytosine, for example. Uh, we got to talk about tautomers and we're going to talk about what happens when you have a tautomeric shift. Uh, yeah, we're going there. All right, you know the drill. Before we get into it, I got to ask for your support. Please take a second, click some of those buttons below. Something else you can do is check out Audible and download a free audiobook of your choice. I just finished this amazing book, which I think many of you would enjoy, conservation, ecology. Anyway, check out Audible. All right, early on, you were taught that the bases are like puzzle pieces. And the reason why adenine and thymine always go together and cytosine and guanine always go together is because that's just how they fit. And that's true. Later in your career, you were shown why they fit the way they do. It has to do with hydrogen bonds. Adenine and thymine are held together by two hydrogen bonds, while cytosine and guanine are held together by three. And wow, isn't that beautiful and everything makes sense? But then they hit you with this. Oh my gosh, there can be changes and mutations and purines and pyrimidines can even be switched out and they don't tell you why and it's all very frustrating and most textbooks don't explain it but you came to the right place. We're gonna talk about how that happens. First, we have to understand what structural or constitutional isomers are. They're molecules with the same molecular formula, but they're connected differently. Look, an example, here's butane, C4H10. Look, this is isobutane, it's also C4H10. So the number of carbons and hydrogens is the same, but the structure is different. And this is an example of a chain isomerism. Let's look at another one. Here's one uh, some of you may know, that's ethanol. And this is dimethyl ether, uh, that's toxic. You find it in propellants and things like hairspray and bug spray. These are also structural isomers and we call them functional group isomers because the functional groups that stick off of the chain are different. Okay, here's a quick analogy for you. Okay, we're gonna look at Lego, okay, we're gonna look at building bricks. And you know how, oh God, the lawyers, you know how sometimes you get a kit and you can build two different toys from the same kit? That would be a great example of a structural isomer. Okay, so we got it. Different connectivity. Now tautomers, they are structural isomers. They're a subset, but they can interconvert between the two forms and they exist in an equilibrium. Okay, let's look. Here is acetone, you know acetone. Acetone is in nail polish remover and paint thinner. Acetone exists in two different forms. This form is called the keto form, so named because of the ketone functional group right there. It is in equilibrium with an enol form, so named because there's an alkene and an alcohol group right here. So you get the ene and then you get the all. This is also a functional group isomerism. And the idea is you wanna look at that arrow there, this little equilibrium symbol, and it shows you which form is dominant. So the keto form dominates over the enol form. But the idea is they are tautomers because there are these two different structural forms, but they interconvert. Okay, so in my analogy, it's going to get real weird here. Your let your brick toy is going to spontaneously shift between the two options all by itself. Okay, that's pretty crazy, but you get the idea. This understanding is going to allow us to get at these nucleobases and see what happens when they undergo a tautomeric shift like that. All right, so here's what can happen. In their most common forms, adenine and cytosine exist in what we call an amino form, but when they undergo a tautomeric shift, they become a different shape, and we call them an Immuno form, immuno with an I, and I'm going to designate that with a star, and they exist in an equilibrium between these forms. Notice again, these equilibrium arrows show you which form is the dominant form, in this case, the amino form of each. All right, we got two more bases, guanine and thymine. These are examples of that ketoenol isomerism that we saw earlier with acetone. Same exact idea. Did you notice this is uh, the ketone group and these are the ene all groups over there. Hopefully they're starting to look a little familiar. Same idea, the keto form dominates over the enol form. 
Okay, so now you're ready to see how these play together. So the tautomer of cytosine, C star, binds with adenine. And the tautomer of thymine, that's the T star, binds with guanine. This explains why they do this, guys. The tautomer of adenine binds with cytosine, and the tautomer of guanine binds with thymine. Okay, so these are the structures, but what we're really interested in in biology has more to do with what happens to the DNA. Typical and atypical base pairings. You guys ready? We're going to look at a very simple strand. This is ultimately supposed to code for the amino acid lysine. We're gonna replicate it twice, we're gonna have a tautomeric shift, and we're gonna see what happens. You guys ready? So here we have our first replication. So we've got some separation here, and this adenine is gonna undergo a tautomeric shift. It's gonna switch to the amino form. And so instead of a thymine being bound to it, it's gonna bind a cytosine. Okay, ready? So here are all the other bases coming in like they're supposed to, and boom, there's that C. That's bizarre. Okay, let's go ahead and put the backbone in there. It looks a little bit better. Okay, now what's going to happen? We're going to replicate again, and the thing to notice is that adenine is going to revert back to the amino form. That's the more stable form. That's the form it's in most of the time. But this cytosine that stays. It has changed. That's a mutation because of the previous tautomeric shift of its partner. Okay, let's go ahead and fill in the rest. And now you notice we've got one mutant copy. The rest are all wild type or normal. We're going to go ahead and transcribe those. And again, you're going to see there is one change when we translate instead of lysine because of that tautomeric shift we get arginine instead. Okay, so just to be super clear here, you can see why tautomeric shifts are a little tricky, right? It's not a mutation in and of itself. It's just a change from usually a common form to a more rare form, as we saw here, from the amino form to the amino form in the case of adenine. The tautomeric shift in adenine produced a mutation in the complementary strand, and that is the mutation, which is going to cause, in this case, a change in the amino acid from what should have been lysine to arginine. I hope we made some sense out of those tautomeric shifts. Now, one more question. Is it going to matter in the final protein? And uh, to get at that, I'm going to recommend this video, Amino Acids and Protein Structure. That'll take you there. As always, I hope that was helpful. Thank you so much for visiting the Penguin Prof channel. Please show your support by clicking those buttons below. Like, share, subscribe, hit that bell. Join me on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Good luck.